Well, thank you for all being here. Um, I don't get a chance to talk about the, the details of how I do paintings. Very seldom get a chance to do that. And so I'm hoping that uh, all of you are inter specifically interested in history. And so hopefully you will enjoy getting into some of the backstory on some of these paintings that I normally don't get. I don't get a chance to tell the stories. So um, anyway, we'll um, start in on this. Um, the um, first thing um, I wanted to show, the, the main part of this talk tonight is going to be uh, this featured painting, a recent painting I did of Captain Vancouver's um, flagship, the HMS Discovery, and its um, tender, the Chatham. Um, and so that, the main thrust of the story will be about the, the research done on that. But first I want to just mention uh, this array of, these are framed prints, and none of these are originals here, but these are all framed prints that are currently on display up on the sixth floor of the um, Western's uh, Wilson Library at the university. And the show, will, these will go back up there and they'll be on display for, um, until the end of May. So, and they each have a historical write-up that goes with them that tells actually what each ship is actually doing in the scene. <coughs> Excuse me. Just getting over a cold still. So, um, the, um, so I'm, I'm just going to briefly point out these, um, the paintings as we go across here, uh, which show, kind of depict the, the, begin, the opening up of the Pacific Northwest uh, to Europeans and the Western world. So at the beginning, uh, the Spanish actually were up along this coast, uh, did some uh, preliminary uh, voyages, but didn't actually stop anywhere on our coast. So the first vessel that stopped would be, this is Captain Cook's ship, the HMS Resolution. And he actually stopped and spent a month in Nootka Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And so that was, they really got to um, uh, get a, begin a, an understanding of the Pacific Northwest. Pardon? Um, uh, I think so. Mary Joe's looking into it. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Mary Jo. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, again, the HMS Discovery off the west coast of Vancouver Island in 1778. And then when the um, resolution got uh, on its way back to England, stopped at uh, China, and in China, and they ended up selling furs that the sailors had bought or traded with the uh, natives population just for, to keep warm, just wrap themselves in furs and like blankets and stuff. And they got to China and discovered that these sea otter pelts, were they could sell them for $100 a pelt in those days, $100, and it would have been a fortune. So as soon as the, the crew got back to England, the word got out, and so fur traders started coming to the Northwest. So this painting here is the ship called the Imperial Eagle, which was a commercial, strictly a commercial venture um, captain by Ch Charles Barclay and his young bride, Sir, uh, Francis Barclay, who was, he was only 26 years old and she was 18 years old. And I, I can't even imagine what that must have been like. She sailed with him for five years um, all around the world several times and insisted on sailing with him. He tried several times to talk her out of it, but um, she wouldn't. She was, I think they were a very close married couple, and she, what an adventurer. So I painted, um, painted you can, if you look closely, you see Captain Barkley on the quarter deck, and Frances is right next to him in a blue dress, and she has red hair. So anyway, that, that, I was fascinated by this story. Um, then with the other fur traders, this was Captain Gray, the first American uh, fur trader to come out west with the ship Columbia from Boston. So that was a major venture from New England to come out and trade for furs. And here they are um, anchored in Clayoquot Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And I was trying to portray in this painting uh, the feeling, the atmosphere, and that this was not their world. This was the world of the native peoples here. And so it's very misty and sort of mysterious looking. And here's this ship that showed up, sort of like a spaceship would show up today. So I was trying to um, capture some of that in this, the feeling of the painting. 
This is also the, the uh, Captain Gray's ship, the Columbia, again. This is um, in near Tofino, um, and where they were anchored for the winter. They spent the winter in this harbor. And this is the only time that the Lady Washington was with them uh, after she'd been re-rigged as a brig. So she actually is a two-masted square-rigged ship, or square-rigged brig here. And um, so they are anchored in Tofino. Then the, actually, this painting here is then when uh, the, the Columbia, again, was sailing just off the west coast of Vancouver, I mean, the west coast of the uh, state of Washington, off La Push, and they met the um, Captain Vancouver's two ships were first arriving on the coast to do part of their um, uh, um, very extensive charting of the entire Pacific Northwest all the way up to Alaska. So this is the HMS Discovery, Vancouver's flagship, and the tender Chatham with them. And they just, a chance meeting off the west coast of, uh, of uh, just off La Push in 1792. So this was April 1792. Uh, when they happened to meet, and they stopped and spoke to each other and exchanged information about what they had discovered already. Then the, the, the uh, Columbia continued on down south to discover the Columbia River and name it for the ship Columbia. And then Vancouver came, all, came further north and, and went into the Straits of Juan de Fuca and began the whole survey of all the Pacific Northwest and doing a magnificent job of charting, I might add. So then the, um, the remaining picture, oh, and I, I must digress a moment. The, uh, the little painting right down on the end is the Spanish schooner, the Santa Saturnina. And it was actually the very first European belt, built vessel to sail across Bellingham Bay. So it was the first little sailing ship to, sailing schooner, to sail across Bellingham Bay in 1791. So it was just a year before Vancouver got here. Um, and so anyway, that's what it looked like. But it's amazing. The vessel was only like 42 feet long. And so it was a tiny little sailing vessel um, that had sailed from Nootka Sound in to explore the Salish Sea, or Puget Sound. Um, so. Then, in 1792, Vancouver arrives and <clears throat> begins his survey of the, the whole uh, Salish Sea, basically, as we call it today. Um, this, this, let's see, as they came in the Straits, um, Vancouver dispatched the Chatham to uh, scout the San Juan Islands. So this painting here is showing the brig, the Chatham, uh, entering Cattle Pass, which is the southern entry to the San Juan Islands uh, between the south end of uh, San Juan Island and uh, Lopez Island. Um, so they, um, they basically were the first ones to actually chart the interior of the San Juan Islands. The Spanish had already sailed around the San Juan Islands and had named them the San Juan Archipelago, but the Chatham was the first one that sailed in between the islands and charted them. Um, <clears throat> Then they worked their way further into, um, down towards Seattle, and where they actually um, anchored. Here it shows the HMS Discovery and the Chatham anchored off of present day Seattle. And so this is Bainbridge Island in the background and the Olympics. So the view is sort of looking nor um, north, uh, northwest. For you sailors, all of you sailors here in the audience that um, the, one of the preferred ways of discovering, I mean, to explore uncharted waters was they liked to sail in with, with the tide, sailing against the tide, with the tide running out, so it was, it was ebbing, so that if the ship ran into anything, they could just take the sails down and hopefully the, the tide would get them back into safe water. But, but ahead of them, then they always sent, this is a cutter, um, sent them ahead sounding with a, a lead line to see how deep it was to make sure it was as safe as they could get it. And they're under shortened sail, you can see, so that if they do bump into anything or hit anything, it's fairly easy to quickly get the sails down and try and drift off. So, and then, speaking of running aground, um, this picture here then is, is the Chatham, again. Um, after they had explored 
um, around all of down Puget Sound, all the way down past the present day um, city of Olympia. The, the sh ships got underway and were working their way up near Everett and they thought they could sail inside of um, Kameno Island. And this, the view right here is after the Chatham ran aground and to the south it would be Everett. So this view is looking straight south sort of from where Stanwood would be. And this is Kameno Island on the right hand side of the picture and this is the mainland on this side. So they thought they could sail right up through there but as they were sailing into the, uh, into that, it's called Port Susan. Um, it turns out that the um, Captain Vancouver in the, in the log says that the Chatham ran aground due to negligence of a seaman. And you're thinking, this was really serious, you know, that you didn't, you know, and so I was really fascinated. I thought, what negligence, what, what happened? And so I, to do all these paintings, one of the things about the research was that in those days, I, before the, um, internet, I had to send to England and actually order Xerox copies of the actual print handwritten logs, the journals that were kept by all the people on board. So on the Vancouver expedition, there were actually, I think, 13 or 14 journals that still exist of every day of what was happening. So the, even though the remarks are very brief, um, by having 13 of them, you can piece together pretty well what happened. And so anyway, they mention that um, a seaman David Dorman, so his name will go down in history forever, <laughs> was calling out false soundings. And they had been sailing as they came past Everett and coming up the inlet, it was 20 fathoms deep, so that's like over 200 feet deep. So he was heaving this lead, letting this line go down 200 feet and then having to pull it up. And he kept doing that and it was the same, 20 fathoms, 20 fathoms, 20 fathoms, and finally he thought, you know, maybe I just won't let the line go all the way down. I'll just throw it, splash it in the water and wait, and then just lift it up and say 20 fathoms, and then the boat went onto the mud. And so anyway, then I thought, well, he must, that was a serious offense. What, did he, what happened? And it said he was punished with 36 lashes. So that would have hurt. Anyway, but fortunately, the tide came in, and the, um, the vessel was floated off and no damage at all. But it was a serious breach of, um, of discipline there. And incidentally, I had to get the tides in those days. Now you can get the tides uh, for 200 years ago on the internet. Um, but in those, when I did that painting, I, had, I wrote to Noah uh, down in Seattle, and there was an expert on tides and currents, and he was very excited to help me because he said, nobody's ever asked me what the tides 200 years ago were. <laughs> And so he really got excited about it. So anyway, he told me exactly what the tides were for that day in 1792. So I could make it accurately show the, how far the tide went out. Um, then, um, then as the ships continued to work their way north, they came up Rosario Strait. And this painting here was my most recent painting of the HMS Discovery in Rosario Strait. Um, we're right near Cypress Island here, and this is Mount Baker, and the view is looking toward, Anna Cortes would just be just out of the, the picture here on this side. So that's Guimas Island right behind there, and uh, Cypress Island here. So it's actually where, if you come from the ferries from the San Juan Islands, from Friday Harbor, you come right out of Thatcher Pass and head right to Anna Cortes right here, so it would go right past this spot. Anyway, this is the painting then that I'm gonna be uh, talking about the research and finding some really exciting new information about how the discovery looked. So with that, we'll start the program here. And I'll have a period afterwards if you wanna ask questions um, afterwards, or actually feel free to ask it during the talk too. Okay. So we're all familiar with, mostly familiar at least with um, Captain Vancouver, and we've gone through kind of what he, he did this magnificent job of charting the whole Pacific Northwest. Um, so his flagship was the HMS Discovery. Now, to portray these uh, ships in as accurately as possible, I, we try and other marine artists and myself, we try and get as much information as we can. So fortunately, <clears throat> with the HMS Discovery. Fortunately, there were, at the, since it was the Age of Enlightenment in the late 18th century, um, the 
everybody, there were so many people excited about making lists and, and printing uh, records and printing information and getting it published and getting it out to people. So it was fast. It's, it's terrific that we're, we're fortunate that we have, these are two really important, um, these are facsimile books that I have, but they were, they've been re reprinted from the originals. Um, the upper one, uh, oops, oops. This one here was by Darcy Lever called a Sea Officer Sheet Anchor and was uh, the second edition was published in 1818, although the first edition, most of the information in it was basically um, in 1790. Um, so it's exactly current with what all of these paintings are about. And then the second one here is David Steele's Mass Making, Sail Making, and Rigging. And it was um, published in 1794. And again, these are just facsimile, um, easy to buy, relatively inexpensive copies, but they detailed, they show, they tell every single detail about how to rig a ship of that period. And so ships like the Lady Washington are completely rigged using these two books because they, they give, uh, every page tells entirely how to, exactly how to completely do all the rigging to make the sails. You can see here the extra thick pieces of sail that they put on for anti-chafing and where the reef points are and the strengthening areas on it, and it, it's just, they're just amazing. So from these, having these books, you can, that's how doing all the rigging, this um, intricate rigging is all done accurately from using these books to tell exactly what shape they were. <clears throat> so again, fortunately, for the HMS Discovery, she was built as a merchant ship in 1789 and she, uh, before she was launched, the Admiralty needed a, a research vessel, and so they purchased her on the stocks before she was even launched, and, and then made these, Admiral, these drawings, so the British Admiralty made these drawings of the brand new ship um, at, just before she was being launched, and then they converted her, added more cabins inside it um, for, for this great uh, journey that Captain Vancouver ended up uh, doing. And there's something really, I want to point out a couple of interesting details about this um, ship. Uh, it was very typical in those days that the Admiralty was interested in the ship's lines and what the ship looked like and how it was um, constructed. But they weren't particularly interested in the, um, oops, sorry, hit the wrong one. They weren't interested in the decorations so much. So you can see where the figurehead would be here is just left blank. And the same thing across the stern, all the fancy, uh, the great cabin where the, the captain's cabin was across the stern is just left blank. So that's not helpful to a marine artist who would like to dis, um, illustrate the ship as accurately as possible. But you can see how accurately all the rest of the, the rigging is very extremely, um, extremely accurate and well detailed here. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that is very important that I'll point out now and we'll come back to is you notice the very unusual shape of the discovery in that she had no tumble home. And that's a term that I will show you in just a second um, in the next slide. But the ship was wider at the upper deck than she was at the waterline, which in those days was extremely unusual. And in all the, my research at the National Maritime Museum in, in Greenwich, um, I went through hundreds of plans of ships and didn't ever find a single one except this one that had these slab sides like that. And this will be important in a minute. I'll point that out. Um, and so here's an example of Tumble Home. This, this is a, a typical merchant ship of the period, eight, late 18th century. And you can see how this was almost every ship was all ships and foreign ships, you know, all European ships, American ships, all had this tumble home to the sides where the widest part of the ship was at the waterline and then they came in narrower. And it was partly a feature to reduce weight, topside weight of the ship, uh, because if you cut out all this extra framing and wood and everything here, it gave the ship more stability. Also, when it was laying alongside a dock, when they were unloading it, it could be 
uh, lean, you know, heel one way or the other, and it wouldn't hurt anything on the sides of the ship. And the same thing then later with warships, they continued the same practice because they had to have all these heavy guns on deck, and they did not want them way out near the edges where the ship would be rolling. It would accentuate the roll. So all ships were built like this, but for some reason, the man, um, Randall was his name, that built the, the Discovery, decided to build it like this, and we've never had any explanation of why, but that's how she was. So it was a very unusual shape. Um, now here was a, a wash painting, a study it looks like, for, another, for a, a painting that was never done. It's identified as the Discovery, HMS Discovery, and it was done, it's been attributed to an artist uh, named Robert Cleveley, who was an extremely good, um, uh, became a famous uh, British maritime artist. So he was, fortunately, he, I mean, he was very accurate. And so you see this, this is his drawing, it actually, and so it says the discovery, but to further make sure that it is, is this actually Vancouver's discovery, here's a comparison of his wash drawing with the actual plans of the discovery. And you can see there's details. Um, first of all, fortunately, he included a figurehead, but unfortunately, it's kind of blurry and he can't really see, doesn't help that much. But you see here, there's certain details that are very clear where it identifies that the chain plates here are separated because there's a gun port right in here. And you see right here, the gun port with the separation of the uh, chain plates. Same thing back here. The um, backstays are separated from the main channel because of this gun port here. And you see there it is again. Then the, the mizzen shrouds and chain plates are separated because of a gun port right there. And you see again right here. And so there's a number of details uh, that are really important in identifying this vessel as Captain Vancouver's discovery. And even though this particular drawing doesn't help me that much, it's a confirmation that the same artist um, did this painting of the discovery before she left England in uh, 1791. So the oldest, or the, this is the f first drawing that we've known of, um, of the actual discovery done on on the spot in 1792 in Queen Charlotte Sound, so on their trip out here, after they'd explored through Puget Sound here, and they were on their way north, and they ran aground in Queen Charlotte Sound and almost lost the, the flagship, almost completely lost. I mean, it looks like a very dire situation here. And this is uh, First Lieutenant Zachariah Mudge um, did this original um, little watercolor painting apparently right while the ship was aground there or right after it, but anyway, and this painting, um, Lynn and I were in Sydney, Australia just last year, and so they got this the original painting out for me to, I tell you, had to take it out of a package and got to hold it right in my hands, but you can see how small it was. It was just a page of his log book that he had done this little painting in. So, but it's a very important painting because it shows the, the discovery at the time um, in 1792 when it was out here. Now here's a, we'll do a little closer up of it. So this is a closer up view of it. And I was very excited about it to try and see if we could see much, get much out of the stern um, decorations. But unfortunately, most of the stern's underwater and he didn't really um, cover the, the details on the stern that well. And again, this is the, the uh, Chatham, the tender of the Chatham in the background here. But they, they were fortunately able to save the ship and um, get back on underway again. This is a close-up then to try again, but you can, just, you can see you, just, you can't really make out much of the stern here. Now this is the last illustration of the discovery in a sad, deplorable situation as a, as a convict hulk in 1828. This was done by an extremely good um, artist Edward Cook, um, and so it's very accurate. He was a very prided himself on accuracy. So this was very important to um, to us marine artists to study this. And so the next scene here is where I um, I did a Photoshop 
where I blot, blocked out all the parts that they had been built, added onto the ship as a convict hull to try and get it back down to sort of what it looked like as, um, as the actual, as Vancouver's flagship. But one of the things here you can see that even in, oops, keep, I pushed the wrong one. Okay, well. You can see here that it shows the slab sides that these big braces on here, you see, go straight up and down. They don't curve in. And so once again, that helps identify that, yes, indeed, it is the, uh, the, the um, Vancouver's discovery. And it was identified. He writes, it's actually, it says right here, HMS discovery. But he mislabeled um, it in saying that it was Captain Cook's discovery, which was an entirely different vessel and that had long been broken up and uh, uh, dismantled before 1828. So then uh, I'll do a close-up of this, why this is. So this was, this scene, or this engraving was extremely important to me and other maritime artists who were doing research on the discovery because it finally showed fairly clearly what the stern looked like. And, but however, this was 40 years later, so it was hard to tell how much alterations had been made. But it, did, it has five windows in the great cabin across here. And then these quarter galleries were actually originally the officers' heads, the toilets. And so they don't have a window in the back of the toilet. They do have windows on the sides. And the, um, uh, but anyway, so it was important to see that it, it had just five windows across here. Sometimes the larger ships had windows in the actual quarter galleries, but this one, this does not at this point. The other thing here, it shows that, that the rather plain moldings for decorations around the stern. And so I thought, well, you know, it was a merchant, built as a merchant ship, so that wouldn't be unusual that it would have rather plain um, decorations. So that's, and that was the best that any of us, we maritime artists, had to go on. So a number of us followed this, sort of this same idea. So then I took this information and I superimposed a color study on the, the actual plans of the discovery with my interpretation from the um, Cook's, uh, Edward Cook's 1828 view as a prison ship. And so that's what I, my best guess at what she would have looked like. So then I did, in 1978, I did a painting of her showing a stern view. For, this was actually for the cover of uh, Robert Wing's book called um, Peter Puget. That you may have seen the book. It's been around for many years. Um, so I'll show you a, a close-up then of the stern. And you can see that I had done it based on the, the convict ship's uh, appearance, just as a best guess. And again, this is the painting right here. Again, and other, other maritime artists had done similar paintings using pretty much kind of the same idea, come to the same conclusions that maybe that was the best she did. But, so then, years later, I, uh, oh, um, Mark Myers is a, uh, also a very well-known um, maritime artist who lives in England. He's, li li he's actually an American. He grew up in Blaine in San Francisco, but actually has lived almost all his life in England. He's an extremely good artist. And so he was um, making a trip on the Alaska cruise, or Alaska ferry. It was coming back down from Alaska after doing some research in Alaska. And I knew he and his wife were going to stop here in Belling as the, as the ferry landed. So I went down and uh, called him and went down and met him and took him out for lunch and just to say hello to him. We'd been friends for years because we both showed at the um, Kirsten Gallery in Seattle. And so um, we had a nice lunch, and at the end of it, he said, oh, by the way, Steve, he says, you know, I, found, I ran across some new information on the uh, discovery that you might be interested in. He said, when I get back to England, I'll send it to you. And I went, oh, great, that sounds interesting. And I thought, well, it'd be some minor little detail, something. So about a month later, um, I got in the mail a Xerox, and with his notes on it saying, I, th here's some, a painting that was um, in the Whitby Museum in England, um, and it said it was Captain Cook's HMS Discovery. 
And he said, but it's not. It's Vancouver's ship, it looks like. And so I was, I was just astounded when I saw this picture. And I thought, oh my gosh, look at the detail of the stern. And I'll, I'll give you a close-up in a minute to be able to see all this. But one of the first questions was, well, is this, is this when they, in Whitby, they thought it was Captain um, uh, Cook's discovery. And as it turns out, no, it's not, because once again, you can see, here's the ladder. Uh, this is a ladder just down to a, a work float here. So it's just a regular step ladder set up there. But here you can see behind it are the actual uh, steps nailed on the side of the ship. And you see how that they go straight up and down? They don't have tumble home. This ship back here has tumble home. It's too fuzzy to see here from this distance, but the, the ladder would go up and curve in. The other thing about it is that you can see right here, this is a, um, a big timber that's fastened to the side of the ship for the four coarse um, sheets. But um, you can see also it's straight up and down and see the gun ports are cut, or show the sides to be straight up and down. And again, as I said, there were, I have never run across a ship of this period that had slab sides like that other than the, the HMS discovery of Vancouver's uh, trip. So, and then once again, uh, well, I'll show you the next slide here. So, again, to help confirm this, um, here you can see some of the details that I pointed out. I reversed the um, plan of the discovery here so that you can see that, once again, the, the way the mizzen shrouds here are separated so that there can be a port right there. And the same thing right here, that the backstays for the main, the main backstays are on a separate little pedestal right here with a, a gun port in between right here. And then they're separated again down here for another gun port right here. And so there's enough little details that are just, oh, and, and look at this mizzen backstay on a separate little pedestal right here. And see, there it is right there. So of course, as a sailor, I get really excited about all these little tiny details. But it was very important in this situation to positively identify this image as the HMS discovery of uh, Captain Vancouver's ship. Here's a little closer up view of it. I think I'll just keep going in. Oh, by the way, while the ship was tied up here, they had originally assigned uh, Captain Henry Roberts, for whom Roberts Bank is, I mean Roberts, Point Roberts and Roberts Bank is named after. He was assigned to lead the expedition, to be in command of the discovery, and, and come out here and do the whole charting. But um, there was an interruption with a huge Nootka controversy with a, the, where Spain and England almost went to war over an incident out in uh, Nootka Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So they postponed the whole trip. And while, they, while the ship was laid for a year in the Thames River, tied up at Deptford, and the guy that was in charge of the ship um, and I've always, I thought it was kind of curious here to think that this Robert Cleveley, while he was sitting, obviously sitting in a boat doing this very detailed drawing of the, of the ship, um, that right up um, leaning over the rail is apparently the officer in charge. Um, this is just a seaman doing some work on deck, but this obviously is an officer because he's not uh, um, clearly employed at anything doing right there, just leaning on the rail. And the man that was in charge of the ship for the whole year while she was laying in the, in the Thames River there was Peter Puget, Lieutenant Peter Puget. So I always thought that, that actually could be Peter Puget standing right there looking at Robert Cleveley while he did this, this drawing of it. So here's a close-up of the view. And this is the part now that shows how, this is the part that I was extremely excited about because no one had ever seen up close what what these details looked like on the stern. And even though I, I believe that Cleveley had just, that this was just done as a study for a possible commission painting that, that was never painted, probably or post, likely because of the postponement of the whole voyage, uh, maybe one of the other officers had commissioned a painting and he got this far with it and then they, weren't, they didn't go on the uh, voyage, so they dropped the commission. But fortunately, even though this may have just been a study, he at least did as much, showed as much detail work as he could in a quick kind of a study. And you can see that it's obviously very Baroque, a very ornate carvings. 
These look to me like they're diving um, seabirds. They have a deeply forked tail up here. Their head is down, down low, so they're diving. Um, and then a, a, a beautiful circular motif here. And again, these are the officer's heads here. So for privacy, there was no window in the back of the heads. But it does show the five, confirms the five window great cabin. Here they have a couple of uh, louvers in, the windows are open for ventilation but with louvers in them. These windows are open without louvers. And there's one window closed, which is nice because it actually shows how many panes that the windows actually had. Um, interpreting these details, of course, really got to be a problem. And I started looking at it and saying, wow. And I asked my wife, Lynn, I said, do you see, I see mermaids there. And she said, oh, Steve, you know, come on. It's, it's so, you know, it's not very clear. And I said, no, really, look. The, look at this looks like a body a head, person's head and their body and a curved back tail behind and I said look over here There's another person with a maybe a curved up tail here and in the middle here What are these figures and she said oh, you know, it's like a Rorschach test if you look at it long enough You can see dancing hippos and frolicking monkeys and whatever and so I said well I you know I know but I, I, I I'm still thinking about it so so I began to work with it and to do a study, a color study. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I did that, I started to do the um, an actual um, composition to work up to see what would the painting look like um, with Mount Baker in the background, placing it w uh, on a day where they were becalmed in Rosario Strait. And so, mainly, this had to do with the composition of the painting. Um, I indicated the decorations here, but. That wasn't my focus at this point, it was more to get the, the overall thing. And you can see here that at this point, in this drawing, I had the Chatham on the same heading as the Discovery, where in the actual finished painting, um, the Chatham has lost steerage way and is actually facing more towards us. Um, so, let's see, so from this painting, so anyway, I worked out, decided that this would be a good, um, good scene to do, and then went ahead with my color study for the stern of the discovery. So trying to compare and work up as much as I could from what you can see here into uh, some sort of a more cogent uh, decorative style. And again, I can't say for sure that's what this stuff is. Somebody else might have a different interpretation of it, but it was the best I could do, I thought, to get it kind of close to do my painting. And then here's another, an even further close-up of it. Again, this is just a, a closer-up view of it. And you can see here's my, my mermaids in there. I put mermaids here, both sides of like Neptune in the middle. Oh, and in the, uh, the actual illustration, in Cleveland's illustration, there are three points that stick up from this area in the middle. And it's hard to tell what they are, but I took that to be, well, the three uh, points of the crown, tried uh, uh, Neptune's crown there. And I put a, a mermaid over here on the sides, supporting some of this Baroque scroll work. Uh-oh, my little, yeah, there. Another mermaid there. But here you can see the diving birds, and that, that I'm quite clear about, sure of that. So this is then the painting as it, turned out, and you can see I now have the Chatham swung around and lost um, steerage way. The significance of this scene was that this was the day that the Chatham lost its anchor in, in um, just off Rosario Strait. And that anchor is still on the bottom in our local maritime museum here, the Bellingham Maritime Museum. We have done a number of uh, attempts to locate it and have made some progress, but still have not identified it as such. But I, partly I wanted to show the, I was trying to, think, when I asked Lynn about it, I said, well, I want to illustrate, show the, the Chatham losing its anchor. And you go, well, you know, how do you do that? You know, I mean, what kind of a scene? Like a bunch of people standing on deck going, you know. <laughs> but, and I thought, well, wait a minute. Okay, what if I did it just, the painting to show the setup just before it happened, what was happening. And here they had, they had got underway from the south end of Lopez Island and were just working their way up Lo Rosario Strait, and the wind died. 
but the, they had the flood tide with them, and so the tide started moving them up, and their, their point of this, was they were just going to get the ship, both of them, over to anchor in Strawberry Bay on the west side of Cypress Island. So they were only gonna move the ship seven miles. So they were almost, they were halfway there at this point. But the tide started sweep, sweeping the Chatham up towards Bellingham Channel. And so at this point, they're becalmed, they have lost steerage way, um, they're just at the mercy of the tides. Fortunately, the, dis the Discovery was able to make it into Cypress, uh, Strawberry Bay, but the Chatham started being carried over this direction and dropped her anchor, her stream anchor, which was a small, kind of the, what we'd call today a lunch hook, just a small anchor to, that was handy to handle. They dropped it, and when they fetched up on it, the, the, the anchor road broke, and then they had to drop one of their larger bower anchors, and they, then they got the ship secured and anchored. The next day they tried to find drag for the anchor and were not able to find it, so then they worked their way around and got into Strawberry Bay and met the Discovery, where then they went on their way the next day, so, and leaving the anchor there. Um, one of the little um, bits that I thought would be funny to add in here was that one of the things about Vancouver was that he was noted for kind of micromanaging, and of course he was the commander of the whole expedition, so uh, to give him credit, he was in charge of the whole thing and a lot of people's lives, but the, on the, the uh, Chatham, they were always uh, very upset to have him always signaling to make more sail, that the Chatham was a slow sailor and had a hard time keeping up with the Discovery when she was sailing out in the ocean. So they were always sending up flag signals saying, make more sail, and they were going, okay, you know, try and put up some more sails, and so this was kind of a sore spot with them. So in this situation, I happened to have, I bought a book when I was in England in um, um, 1977, I saw a book on, it was called Flag uh, Instructions and Signals for the Royal Navy, 17, 1774 to 1795. And I thought, you know, someday I might need that. I have no idea why, but I thought that would be good to know what the signals, the flag signals were. The inter they were developing, they hadn't developed the international flag code signals yet. So, so from that book, I was able to see right at this period, in 1792, what, flag, what book of, of signals they had with them on this trip. And so the signal that I have them run up here on the mizzenmast is the top one says, is signaling to the Chatham, you're out of position. And it's sort of like, you know, yeah, we, we got that. And the second one is start towing. And so you can see they've already got their boat in the water. They've already figured out that we're gonna, they're going to have to start trying to tow the boat to get over this way. But so I, I just added that bit of whimsical stuff in there because I had the details on it. So. Um, here's a closer up then view of the stern details and as I tried to show based on Cleveland's painting, you know. And then here's the, the finished painting again. The, um, the, I'm a member of the Puget Sound Maritime Historical Society down in Seattle and they asked me to, uh, I gave this talk to them right after I had done the painting, and they said, well, would you be interested in writing an article about it? And I thought, yes, this would be great because then I'll finally um, get it in print, the whole story of basically what I'm just telling you now, but in, it's in further details with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, reference notes and everything. So that was nice. They used my painting on, on the cover and did a really nice um, published uh, ver uh, version of this talk. And then, a good friend of mine, Barry Goff, who's a, um, a wonderful historian from uh, Victoria, BC, and has used several of my paintings on the covers of his book, um, had asked me if I had a painting showing Mount Baker uh, in the painting, and so I said, well, what about this one? And so he used this on the cover of his book, and that was fun to have that published right away. Um, so anyway, that is basically the, the background that I went through to, to come up with this painting. And it was a, it's one of the most interesting painting for me, uh, one of the most interesting projects that I've done because of this new information. It was so exciting to be able to illustrate this accurately, finally. So I want to thank you for your, particularly for your um, 
interest in this because I don't get a chance to talk about these kinds of details and go into the kind of details and fortunately there's boaters and yachts people here and stuff that really understand this kind of stuff and are interested in it and all of you have been born with us on this so thank you very much for your kind attention